Hi, so um, I'm here to talk to you about the work we're doing in Mongolia in Kyrgyzstan um, using Earth observation data and open source software. So um, project started in Mongolia, but it's been extended to cover Kyrgyzstan too. Um, we're looking to provide improved pasture monitoring capabilities in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan um, because they've got um, very large herding communities um, that make a significant contribution uh, to their economy. So we're using Earth observation, Earth observation data uh, because it allows us to um, access a very large area. Um, Mongolia is quite big, um, as is Kyrgyzstan, um, so that we can access that sort of uh, countrywide um, level of data so that we can get information about pasture and the snow levels and also how drought is affecting the land. Um, so we're looking for this to help improve the um, decisions that they make with regard to pasture management for those herding communities. Um, and we, we're working with a number of people in the country. So we're a bit farther ahead in Mongolia because we started there first. Um, so in terms of the development of the products that we've produced um, and the training that we've delivered, um, we did manage a couple of visits to the country this year. Um, delivering some training in Mongolia and having a technical kickoff in Kyrgyzstan. So we should mention that um, this project is supported by the UK Space Agency International Partnership Programme. So this is a five-year programme with a decent chunk of cash um, being used to, um, to deliver sustainable economic or societal benefit to the countries that it's been um, um, being used in. Um, so there are a number of projects being worked on and it's due to be completed in March 2021, although there is a possibility that that may be extended. Okay, so in Mongolia, um, they have something that happens called a azud. Um, this is where they have dry summers that lead to poor pasture. And then if that's followed by a harsh winter, um, that means that their livestock can be in quite a lot of trouble and large numbers can die off. Um, as the population is dependent on livestock herding to a very heavy extent, this is quite significant um, for the country. Um, another factor is climate change. So this means that um, the zuds, when they do happen, are exacerbated by that. The events are becoming more extreme. So we're looking to help the resilience for that. In Kyrgyzstan, they have a slightly different problem in that they don't generally have such um, events as Tzuds, um, but they have experiencing land degradation that's made worse by climate change. Um, so the graph here is showing that it's the third most vulnerable country to climate change in Europe and Central Asia. Um, so this is partly caused by altered precipitation patterns and more frequent heat waves. Um, this is particularly happening in mountain pastures. Something else that they have um, an issue with in Kyrgyzstan is um, the encroachment of inedible, um, inedible pasture. So in this picture here, we've got some caragana, um, the, the yellow flowers. Um, so there's some people trying to clear that. So although the, that's growing nicely in that area, it's not edible for the livestock. So that's becoming an issue as well. Okay, so there are a number of project partners. Um, Eosphere are the, the lead for the project. Um, and I work for Deimos who are supporting that. And then we've got the University of Leicester. We've got some organizations in Mongolia. So that's the Meteorological and Hydrological Research Institute. We've also got the uh, Centre for Nomadic Pastoralism Studies there. And we've got um, a couple of organisations in Kyrgyzstan, so they're hydrological and meteorological organisation there as well. And Mercy Corps is supporting us extensively in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I should add that the, the full list of organisations that we're working with is much longer. Okay, so sources of information, what, what do we need to gather to um, help, help these uh, herders? So we need to have information about pasture. We need to know what's happening with regard to snow 
and also with regard to drought. The improvements that we can bring through this project are making sure that there's countrywide coverage of this information, um, ensuring that there are more frequent updates for more of the year, and then um, aiming to give better accuracy and better resolution. So this is our, these are our routes to impact. Um, we're gathering satellite imagery. Um, so some of this is via the internet that we're processing using Python. Um, and then there are, there's other satellite imagery that's sourced via a ground station. So that's just in Mongolia. Um, that information goes into an open data cube and then it's distributed in various different ways to the herding community. So that could be through government coordination. Um, so it could be helping governments coordinate their response for the herding communities. Um, we're also looking to communicate directly with the herding communities. We've got a little TV in there. We are working on getting onto Mongolian, getting our forecasts onto Mongolian TV, but um, there's a, we haven't quite got there just yet. Uh, we're also looking to work with the insurance industry so that um, the information there can be used to help uh, protect herding communities. Okay, so the satellites we're using, so we're getting data for Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, MODIS and VIRS. So we're getting current data, but we're also getting the archive um, further back as well. Um, so we've started off with a number of test regions in Mongolia. Um, Mongolia is a, a very large country. It's just over a third of the size of the EU. Um, so there's quite a lot of data to capture. Um, so we started with the test regions to work out the, the products that we wanted to produce and try them out there. Um, and then now we are moving to processing the archive for the whole of the country. Um, we also prioritise the processing of the otter reserves. So these are areas of reserve grazing for use in emergency situations. Okay, um, it was a very important for us to listen to the herding communities to find out what was important to them and how best to communicate the information to them. So we've got some people talking to the herders and um, showing some showing some of the potential products that we could produce and asking them questions about that. Um, down here we've got a, a nice solar powered generator and a television. So we can see that um, the, household, the herder household information sources, um, TV is the, uh, the, the top source of information for that. Okay, um, we've also um, identified some test sites in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and we've carried out an initial survey about their, the herders requirements out there um, and so we we'll get on to uh, processing that and then developing what we're doing over there as the project progresses. Um, as we've done quite a bit of work in Mongolia we've got a better idea about the products we want to produce so we'll process all the satellite imagery for Kyrgyzstan in one go as the country is a bit smaller as well. Okay, so this gives us lots and lots of data. So what are we going to do with it? Um, we need to be able to analyse it and get it, extract information for particular areas. So the answer for us is to use an open data cube. Okay, so the, it's, uh, we're using an open data cube because it's uh, an efficient way um, of indexing the data and storing the large volumes of imagery that we have. Um, the indexing means that we can access the, um, well, access it spatially and also temporally. Um, so we can include that information in the, the ways that we query the data cube. So it's something that was originally developed by Digital Earth in Australia, and they developed a, a data cube for Australia. Um, more recently, it's been used in other countries, um, and yeah, they're either deployed or in development. Um, something that uh, we're doing that's a bit different to those other data cubes is that we're hosting it on physical hardware. Um, so that was in response to uh, requests um, in country um, in that they didn't want the, the overhead 
of having um, cloud costs um, continuing after the project was over. Um, so that does bring, bring some challenges, not least of which is actually getting those uh, servers over to the relevant countries, um, which we had planned to do in September, but we'll, we'll come up with something there. Okay, so another reason for using an open data cube is that there's a large community supporting it. Um, so this is something that's benefited us in developing the data cube, um, but it's also something that will be um, that will still be there once the the project is over. So it will help with the um, long term um, sustainability of the project, as there'll be many sources of help um, to keep them going. Okay, so um, one of the ways that we've been interacting with the data cube is through Jupyter Hub. Um, so we've been using this to explore the data um, and look at it before we develop um, the actual Python processes that we're using to develop the um, ongoing products that we develop within the data cube. Um, we've also been using it to provide training so this is an example of an excerpt um, of one of the, the notebooks that we've been using. Um, so it's useful because, um, so using Jupyter Hub is useful because it allows us to um, have a notebook that we can work through and that the um, people we're training can interactively work through as well. Um, but they're also able to access it um, when we're not there so they can work through it themselves. Um, so yeah, and <clears throat> It doesn't require quite such um, a high level of knowledge of Python as if you were just writing Python from scratch without um, the notebook. Okay, so here we've got uh, an example of querying the data cube. Um, so just a, a small snippet of Python with the query in it. So we're able to spec specify the um, spatial area that we want to get data from. We can specify a start and end time. We can specify the particular bands um, that we want to get. Um, those bands do need to be present in the, the product that we're choosing to use. Um, so there's a, a deal of flexibility there that's limited by the, the product that you choose. Um, here we're specifying a coordinate system. So um, we've got um, the data stored in two different coordinate systems. So we've got um, WGS84, so latitude and longitude. We've also got a projected coordinate system. Um, so this is helpful um, in that we're able to produce the data in these two different coordinate systems. We can also specify the resolution, although um, we'd exercise caution in how much you vary these values. Um, so um, it doesn't go too crazy. Um, another option is to use Dask, which allows us to load the structure of the data so it can be examined without loading it. So this is very handy in checking out what we've got there before actually carrying out uh, the computation. Five minutes. Cool. So here we're delivering training on the data cube. So this was uh, when we popped over in January. Um, so you can see the, uh, the notebook in action. And this is um, some of the examples of products we're producing for the herders um, that have been tailored for them. So we're producing um, an anomaly product, um, a trend product, a biomass product and an RGB product. So they're able to um, get an idea about what's going on in their particular area. We're also uh, posting, uh, posting these products to Facebook so that um, the herders have a, another means of accessing them um, so that they can view that information that way. So I spoke earlier about um, government institutions having a route um, towards um, getting the information to the herders. Um, so this is the Institute um, of Meteorology and Hydrology in Mongolia and they're producing um, some countrywide products that our data is um, feeding into. Um, so that's uh, another source of getting the information out. Another way that we're distributing data cube imagery is via OWS and that's being consumed 
in a website that we've developed, um, but also um, by other organisations as well. So, um, so for example, the WWF are using it to analyse the habitat of the um, saiga antelope, which is uh, an endangered species in Mongolia and for which um, pasture is also, also important. We're also feeding into a World Food, World Food Programme uh, project called PRISM and also the Otter Reserve mentioned earlier. So the website has been developed using Node, Express and Pug and we're using Leaflet for the, um, for the mapping. Okay, so um, here we've got an example of a greenness graph. So this is um, calculated from the NDVI, which you can see on the map in the background. Um, so we're showing the 10 day median for a region um, in each of those columns. And then the, the general line shows the overall trend for that particular area. Um, from the website, there's also the possibility of exporting the map to PDF or printing it out. So part of the idea of that is that herders will come into um, a Zoom centre. So a Zoom is like a, um, a district um, in the UK. Um, be able to access the um, information there and then take it away with them and make decisions based upon that. Okay, um, so the project ends in March 2021, after which um, the um, hardware and software will all be handed over to people in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan, and they will then be responsible for running the system. So as part of this project, we've learnt a lot from the um, open source software community, um, particularly with regard to developing the data cube, and then that community will help with the, the long term sustainability of this project. Um, so we've been carrying out uh, Skype training and we did have trips planned a bit more um, to deliver more training and get the servers out there. Um, so, yes, and then um, the data cube will be accessible to researchers in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan to carry on the the work that's been done as part of the project. Okay, so thank you, and we have we have another camel. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much, Alison. It's all about the camels, isn't it? Indeed, yes. Um, so we've had a question from Ritu. Have you considered attempting a temporal prediction rather than a real-time measurement? Um, so, so we are we are calculating um, anomaly and trend. So that's um, so that's uh, getting the information going back several years, and being able to calculate what the the general trend is, but also being able to identify where there are any anomalies in the data. So if a particular area, say for the the biomass is higher for a particular area than it would normally be, or whether it's lower. So that's what the um, the anomaly product is that we're producing. So that's, that's something that's um, great about data cubes in that you are able to um, get that temporal aspect into it um, and it provides a great way of dealing with that, um, that time-based data as well as the spatial element of it. Okay, cool. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, so I've got a quick one from me, which is, can you say a bit more about Pug and what that is? I hadn't come across that before. Um, so that's a, um, a templating library um, that allows you to, um, essentially it, it generates the HTML for you. Um, so okay. other, yeah, I just try to think of some other examples that, um, so moustache um, might be another example of that, or Jade is a predecessor to Pug. Okay, cool. All with the names there. Indeed, um, yes. <laughs> and um, so you had four different um, types of data that were listed, I think, as going into your data queue. Mm -hmm. Do you deal with those independently or do you, are there any issues about trying to join different spatial and temporal resolutions across the queue or do, do they get processed in a way that normalizes them? Um, so so we, we process them separately to um, generate analysis ready data. 
um, there are some products where we're um, trying to combine Landsat data and Sentinel-2 data in order to get greater coverage. Um, the, we're still sort of um, identifying exactly, well, we're still analysing exactly how that works um, because there, there are sort of differences between those sensors. Um, and so that's that part of the analysis that we're carrying out, whether it's um, whether there needs to be additional work done to bring them into line with each other. Yeah, I, I don't think you're the only one going to look yep. at that. I came across someone who was working in the um, rainforest and they were saying the same thing, that there's a jump um, between the data sets when you, you look at certain indices. Yeah. So, so another, another thing that we were looking to do was um, with regard to snow persistence. Um, so how long snow is lying on the ground and we were sort of trying to see if we could use the Landsat and Sentinel-2 data to do that but we weren't getting quite, um, we weren't getting the data in a sort of timely enough manner to be able to do that so we've ended up using just MODIS for that. Okay, uh, we've had a question um, from Andrew Cutts. What happens at the end of the five-year project? Will it be able to just run by itself? That's the idea. <laughs> um, well, so so it's um, so March twenty twenty one is the the date that we are um, potentially aiming for. Um, and so yeah, so the the so the general plan was to get the servers out there in September. Um, clearly, there may be some issues with that. Um, but um, and then. Um, provide some training on the system while we're over there. We've already delivered quite a lot of training so um, particularly the people in Mongolia are developing their own products using the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so yeah, um, so they're, they're getting quite comfortable with the um, that sort of workflow okay. and um, yeah then there's sort of uh, some more of the that we need to do a bit more training on the back end side of things to make sure that um, if anything goes wrong on that side of things, um, they'll be able to deal with it. Although we, I think we, but there is, we do plan to provide support um, after the end of the project as well. Okay, cool. And a, a follow up from Andrew is that, do you find that there's any issue around language in terms of trying to do any of the training or trying to get any of the sort of capacity building stuff in, in place? Um, so, Generally speaking, that's been okay. There have been um, some sessions where we've had a translator um, and that's, that's been interesting. Um, but um, generally speaking, the, the um, particularly in Mongolia, well, I haven't actually been to Kyrgyzstan myself, but um, with, when I was out to Mongolia, um, the, yeah, the, the standard of English was good. Um, and there was, um, so, from the questions that were being asked from the training, we could see that there was good comprehension of what we were trying to get across. Cool. Um, and unless anyone has a, a final question to quickly drop into the chat, I will finish up with one that is absolutely nothing to do with Earth observation, but you've got two logos there. One is with a dog yep. and one is with a wolf. What's the yep. So the, the wolf is the initial one that we um, developed for Mongolia. Um, but there is some sensitivity about wolves in uh, Kyrgyzstan, <laughs> right. so um, we, we're using a, a Taigan um, dog, which is a sort of, uh, it's almost like a, a national dog in Kyrgyzstan as well. So, um, so yes, that was uh, deemed more appropriate for Kyrgyzstan. Okay.